Welcome to Two Dudes in a Desk, a weekly sports show by the Eastern Progress where we give our opinions on a couple big sports stories from the week. I'm Robert and I'm the sports editor of the Eastern Progress. And I'm Ian. I'm a sports writer for the Eastern Progress and this week we're talking about a couple big storylines coming out of week one of the NFL season. So let's get right into it. We start with Cincy. The Bengals season has not gone as planned so far through two games. Week one saw them get shut out at home to their division rival Baltimore, and the score wasn't even the ugliest part of the game as the Ravens forced five turnovers on quarterback Andy Dalton. Assuming it was week one problems, which we see plenty of teams go through, people expected a bounce back game last night against the Texans, and that is not what they got. The Bengals kicked three field goals en route to a 13-9 loss to rookie quarterback Deshaun Watson. The game was ugly on both sides as neither team eclipsed 300 total yards and averaged less than five yards to play. Much of the blame has fallen on Andy Dalton, as it should. Since he has yet to score a touchdown on the year, and so far Dalton has thrown four picks on 54% completion percentage with no touchdowns. But this is not the norm for Dalton. Dalton Dalton has thrown for more than 4,000 yards twice in the last four years and is completing above 60% of his passes on his career. He certainly has not been the prime time or elevated himself to the top tier of quarterbacks that Cincy fans have been wanting, but more often than not, he has not been the problem. In 2013, the Bengals lost to the Chargers in the AFC wildcard game 27-10 after going 11-5 and finishing third in the AFC. Dalton was a big problem in this game as he threw two picks, lost a fumble, and got sacked three times. Going into this game, Dalton was touting a one touchdown and six interception record in his previous three playoff games. The loss also marked the fifth loss with no victories in the postseason for head coach Marvin Lewis in his 11th season. A year later, they lose the Colts in the wild card round 26-10 in a game where Indy gained almost 500 yards on the Cincinnati defense and dominated time of possession by almost 10 minutes. The two teams had played earlier in the season, and Indy had the same success on the Bengals' defense then as they had in their playoff game, 0-6 for head coach Marvin Lewis. A year later, they lose 18-16 to the Steelers after taking the lead with a minute and a half left. Vontez Burfitt and Adam Jones, two defensive players for Cincy, got back-to-back 15-yard penalties to put Pittsburgh in field goal range to win the game. Undisciplined teams fall on the coach, and the coach also fell to 0-7 in the postseason. The following year, after losing multiple Pro Bowl caliber players on offense and defense, the Bengals missed the playoffs after going 6-9-1. All of this is to say, over the last 14 seasons that Marvin Lewis has been the head coach, unorganization and a lack of discipline on both sides of the ball have killed the Bengals in the playoffs. The fact that a head coach who has had that amount of talent as Marvin Lewis and is still winless in the postseason makes you scratch your head and wonder why he is the second longest tenured head coach. This is the culprit of Cincy's woes. Over the last two seasons, when Dalton had the weapons like Marvin Jones, Muhammad Sanu, and a more talented defense, he led them to the division title. I don't think Dalton is in the upper tier of quarterbacks, but I also don't think the offense is very mature yet as they rely on a lot of young players, a talented tight end who can't stay healthy, and an all-world receiver who is constantly drawing double teams. If Cincy fans want to change, then it should not be to bring in A.J. McCarron as the starter or get rid of Andy Dalton because you will have the same results, a quarterback attempting to lead an undisciplined and not well-coached team. It's time to get rid of Marvin Lewis, and then maybe we can see the Andy Dalton and Cincinnati teams of a couple years ago, except with more playoff success. The defending champion New England Patriots managed to come to the new season with talk that they could possibly be going 16-0. Well, that didn't happen. In the first game of the season in Foxborough, with the Patriots still trolling Atlanta about a 28-3 blown lead in the Super Bowl, the Patriots came out and gave up 42 points to the Kansas City Chiefs, Rarely do you see Tom Brady play bad and get outperformed by the opposing quarterback, but Alex Smith dominated the Patriots' defense for over 360 yards and four touchdowns. And the star of the game was the rookie from Toledo, Kareem Hunt, who tallied 148 rushing yards, 98 receiving yards, and three total touchdowns. But what makes it even more impressive is that he did all of that after he fumbled on his very first NFL carry. I personally don't think the Patriots have a problem but rather that they ran into a really good team to, the, to start the season. The Pats will do their normal shtick and end up winning 12 or more games, but everyone keep a close eye on Kansas City, along with their new star in Kareem Hunt. <clears throat> America, I hate to tell you, but the team you love to hate is actually legit, and that's the Dallas Cowboys. Now, we knew that they were legit after going 13-3 and with two rookies leading their offense, but many people believe they would take a slight step back this year. 
Much of their success was due to the offensive line, which allowed rookie Ezekiel Elliott to run for over 1,600 yards and finish top five in fewest sacks allowed, making the game easy for the rookie quarterback, Dak Prescott. Combine this with the exceptional use of play action and play calling, Dallas was a force coming into 2017. They lost their right tackle and right guard and inserted the talented but troubled Lyle Collins in at right tackle and injury-prone Chaz Green at guard. Many thought this would cause the line to regress some, along with an eight-game suspension for Elliott. But Elliott got his suspension blocked, and in week one against a talented Giants defense, the Cowboys ran for 130 yards and dominated time of possession. But the biggest surprise was their defense. The Dallas defense has been void of talent for many years, and they have attempted to mend that with minimal success. In three of the last four seasons, Dallas has finished in the bottom third in the league in total yards allowed, including last season. What they have been able to do, however, is make timely plays and turn teams over. Dallas finished in the top 10 in turnover differential the last three seasons and finished a mediocre 15th and third down stops. This offseason, they revamped their secondary after losing all four starters and talented pass rusher David Irving is out for the first four games for PEDs. So nobody was expecting much out of the defense, but they proved everybody wrong beating an explosive Giants team 19-3 at home. The Giants were missing star receiver Odell Beckham, but picking off Eli Manning once and sacking him three times and holding them to under four and a half yards of play was more than what people could have asked for. If the defense continues to play hard and be opportunistic and the offense can grind the ball, dominate time of possession, and not turn the ball over, then the Cowboys have just as good a shot as anybody to win the NFC. The offense will face a huge test this week as they travel to Denver to take on one of the two or three best defenses in the league. If they have success in Mile High Stadium this week, Dallas may be the team to beat. And finally, let's give a shout out to the Cleveland Browns. In week one, as rookie Deshaun Kaiser got the start and almost led the Browns to a win over the Steelers, who some people have in the Super Bowl. Kaiser threw for 220 yards and one touchdown and keeping one to himself for another rushing touchdown. When was the last time a Cleveland quarterback got the start on week one and did not royally disappoint anyone. That'll be bonus points to anyone who can figure it out. I questioned whether Cleveland knew what they were doing when they cut Pro Bowl cornerback Joe Hayden from the team right before the season started, which, to be honest, is a fair assumption to question the Browns' front office moves. But clearly, Cleveland is taking the route of the Philadelphia 76ers and trusting the process by trying to get as much young talent as possible from their draft picks. The Browns did have the best draft of anyone this past season, selecting Miles Garrett, Jabril Peppers, and the aforementioned Kaiser, all with their first three picks. Number one overall pick, Miles Garrett, did not suit up in week one for the Browns due to a minor injury, but here's hoping that he suits up in week two along with his rookie teammate, Jabril Peppers. It appears that the Cincinnati Bengals might be creeping their way up to being the new Cleveland Browns with how they performed in the first two weeks. If Cleveland can get Garrett in his groove and Peppers playing both sides of the ball like he did at Michigan because that is what is going to make him a great player. And Kaiser finally turns out to be the quarterback that the Browns have been looking for since 1999, then the Cleveland Browns could be on their way to turning around a franchise that has been in the toilet for decades. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Make sure you subscribe to the Eastern Progress YouTube channel to get our videos and other content produced by the paper. And be sure to, to subscribe to our podcast channel, Eastern Progress Sports, on iTunes or Stitcher for our weekly sports podcast. Next week, we will take a look at college football and our impressions of the season so far. For myself and Ian, we will see you next week.